What's up everybody, Greg here with Lens Portigo and Lens Rentals, and we haven't taken a look at a new lens in a long time, specifically a photography lens. So in this video, we're gonna be checking out the monster of a lens from Sigma, the 105 f1.4 art lens. So some quick specs about this lens before we get into the comparison. Without the lens hood on, it's just over five inches. When you add that lens hood, it adds another couple inches to it. The body itself is made of a thermally stable composite or TSC, and this material should be much more durable than like aluminum, and it should handle in more extreme conditions a lot better. And it has a fully weather sealed body, so that should help with those inclement environments as well. This lens covers a full frame sensor and has nine rounded aperture blades inside, so you get some really circular nice looking bokeh which we'll take a look at later on. One thing that is kind of surprising with the massive size of the Sigma 105 f1.4 is that there's no IS and with the Nikon 105 f1.4 coming out earlier we know that it's possible to make it in a smaller body and smaller size. My guess is that these larger elements on the Sigma are going to help improve your corner and edge sharpness and you're also going to get less vignetting on the edges but we'll have to find out once we get into the tests. Some of the other comparable options out there, uh, Nikon has a 105 f1.4 like I was just mentioning, and that's probably the closest relative lens to this one. Canon really doesn't have anything that falls in line with this 105 f1.4. The closest they have will probably be the 100 millimeter f2.8 macro L with IS, which is quite a bit different, has a bunch of features that this lens doesn't. And then the Canon 135 F2, which is a super fast prime, but the focal length is a decent bit longer than this 105. So in this video, we're gonna be comparing it to the 100 mil just because that's the closest focal length and will give us the most accurate comparison. So stacking these lenses up next to each other, the Canon weighs in at the least amount at 1.37 pounds. Then it's gonna to go to the Nikon, which is 2.17 pounds. And then lastly, the Sigma at a whopping three and a half pounds, which is just a ton for a small prime like this. It's basically like a mini super telly at this point. And it has a very similar design with the included tripod foot. The next thing is the filter threads. The Canon again has the smallest one at 67 millimeters. The Nikon has the next smallest one at 82. And then you have to jump all the way up to a 105 millimeter filter thread for the new Sigma 105. As for close focusing distance, obviously the Canon's gonna win with this one because it has that macro capability. The distance on that is one foot. And then you go up to the Nikon, which matches the Sigma at 3.3 feet or one meter. So based off the size and weight, the Canon definitely comes in as the smallest lens, but you have to remember that it's an F2.8 and it has IS. So it's a little bit different beast than these other two F1.4s. So I'm gonna go shoot some tests with these right now. The Sigma 105 and the Canon 100 millimeter will be shot on the 5D Mark IV. And then the Nikon 105 will be shot on the D850. I am gonna be shooting in medium raw just to get the pixel density closer to the 5D Mark IV to have them a little more comparable. Then we'll bring them back, throw them into Lightroom and look at them side by side and see what we find out. So I just got back, we finished shooting a bunch of different test images, looking at sharpness, uh, chromatic aberration, exposure, bokeh, all kinds of stuff. So we're gonna start diving into that right now. First, we're gonna take a look at center sharpness. And like I said before, we're gonna be looking at all three of these lenses. So the Sigma, the Nikon, and the Canon 100 millimeter. Uh, right now, we're gonna look at the Nikon and Canon. And I'm always gonna try and keep the Sigma one on the left and then alternate between the Nikon and Canon version on the right side of the image, just so you can keep track of which pictures we're looking at. So for this first one, we focused on the tire of the Jeep. And if we punch into a one-to-one, -one, the again, the Sigma's on the left, the Nikon's on the right, they look very, very comparable. And honestly, I probably wouldn't be able to tell any difference here. What I'm gonna do is punch into a three-to-one, and with this, you can start to see a little bit of detail loss on the Nikon lens, but for the most part, I mean, we're punched into a three to one. This really isn't gonna make or break your image. And if I had to pick a winner for one of these, it probably would be the Sigma, but it's by such a small amount that it's not really gonna matter. Because again, we're punched into that three to one, which is just a crazy amount of crop. Now let's jump over and take a look at what the 100L can do. And again, this is a 2.8, so it is stopped down a little bit, but it's wide open for this lens. Punching into that three to one. Again, same thing. We have a little bit more sharpness and detail retention on the Sigma lens, but we're losing a tiny bit of it on the 100L version. But we're punched in so much that this really isn't gonna make a difference. So again, I'll give a slight edge to the Sigma, but reality, it doesn't really matter that much. 
Next up, we're gonna take a look at the edge sharpness. So we just looked at the center sharpness right in the middle of the frame. Now we're gonna take a look at the edge sharpness or distortion on the sides. Again, starting off with the Sigma and Nikon versions. We have the Sigma one on the left, Nikon on the right. Punching into the center just to check that again. You can see here with a three to one, we definitely have a little more detail on this flat brick wall than we do with the Nikon lens. And you'll notice that even more as we start to go out towards the corners. So if I keep scrolling out here, you'll start to see we're gonna lose a lot of detail on the Nikon lens and we're getting a very blurred image up in the corners. This is super far into the corners though. I mean, you can look at the little navigator over here and we are just barely picking this corner. So you shouldn't be placing your subject there anyway and needing to crop in this much. So again, it's not really gonna make a huge difference. Both of these lenses are super sharp, pretty much all the way out to the edge, but the Sigma does have a little bit more control in those corner areas. Checking the Sigma out against the Canon version in the center, both of them are super sharp. I'd say it's very, very similar to the Sigma versus the Nikon. And then going into the corners, the uh, 100L actually holds it quite a bit better than I was expecting. I was having a feeling that it was gonna fall off just like the Nikon did, but it holds that corner detail pretty sharp. And I would say that both of these lenses are pretty much on par with each other. Next up, we're gonna take a look at chromatic aberration. And for this, we're gonna keep all three lenses at an F2.8, just to keep it even across the whole field. And we'll jump into the Sigma and the Nikon versions first. So the reason I decided to shoot these power lines is it actually shows off chromatic aberration really well. How you get it is when there's some really hard contrast between dark areas and light areas. So shooting these cables, which are dark black, and then up against the sky, which is this very bright overexposed image, we're gonna see any chromatic aberration problems and if it's not handled by the lens. So jumping in right away to a three to one, both of these, when it's in focus, they look super sharp. And then as we go down into those out of focus areas, with the Nikon, it does start to fall apart a little bit. We're seeing a little bit of green color fringing on the edges. If we actually open up to an F2, you'll see it even more. Go down here. So here we are with the Nikon at an F2, and we're seeing a ton of that color fringing in there. We're seeing a lot of greens, not so much of the magentas, and again, like I keep saying, we're having to jump into that three to one to start to see any differences between these lenses. So they're very much on par with each other, but because this is at an F2 and we're seeing that color fringing and we're not seeing that on the Sigma, I have to give it to the Sigma for this one. And then checking out the 100L, we're gonna do the same thing, punch in. Both seem super solid right here. And then as we go to that farther away distance in the out of focus areas, uh, we are seeing a bit of blue and red color fringing on the poles here. We're actually seeing it quite a bit throughout all of this and on the cables. So again, Sigma is gonna take it for the chromatic aberration, which I expected for this lens because it does have some of those extra coatings to help with this chromatic aberration. Next up, we're gonna take a look at exposure shift and vignetting. For this, I just shot up against a white wall so you could very clearly see the exposure. And I don't even need to punch into the images that you can already see some of that vignetting. But if we go in a little more, let me just switch these up. This is opened up all the way to an F1.4, and you can see a crazy amount of vignetting on the Nikon version. And this is where I think these lenses are gonna start to separate. Because of that bigger element on the Sigma, we're not getting any of that vignetting or that distortion in the corners. So if you wanna have the cleanest image possible, I'm definitely gonna suggest going with the Sigma. If you wanna have something that's good for portraits because you already have a little bit of vignette built in, I personally like to do it after the fact if I wanna have vignette and not have it do it in camera for me, then you could go with the Nikon if you like that style. But definitely the Sigma has less vignetting in those corners. If we start to close down and go to an F2, and again, let me flip these, we're starting to clear up already right at an F2, which is very good for the Nikon, but again, it's hard to use this lens wide open because it doesn't have a big enough front element and you're getting that vignetting in the corners. Going down one more to an F2.8, I would say that both of these lenses are pretty even right now, but definitely the Sigma is gonna win this one because it has that 1.4 and the 2.0 with almost no vignetting in it. Just to check it out compared to the 100L, we have quite a bit of exposure drop, but there's not as much vignetting in the corners like there was with the Nikon wide open. So I definitely have to give the vignetting control and the exposure to the Sigma and Canon, specifically the Sigma because it really does well in those corners, even wide open. And the last thing that we're gonna take a look at in Lightroom is the bokeh or the out of focus area of these lenses. 
We're gonna start at an f1.4 on the Nikon and the Sigma. On the left side, that Sigma giving you that beautiful circular bokeh, and we're not really getting too much of the points and sort of oval shape where we're seeing a lot of that on the Nikon version. I don't even need to punch in here. You can see those points that I'm talking about right there. If we drop that down to an F2, we're getting even more of the almost perfectly circular bokeh on the Sigma, where we're still getting some of that distortion and those hard points and kind of football shaped bokeh with the Nikon 105. Going down another stop to an F2.8, with the Sigma at an f2.8, we're starting to see a little bit of those hard edges and those points from the aperture blades, but over the whole image, it's very consistent from edge to edge. When we look at the Nikon, we're starting to see in the corners from the barrel, we're actually getting the bokeh cut off and getting that mist-shaped bokeh on the edges, and it's very inconsistent across the whole image. Since we're at a 2.8, I'll jump over to the 100 millimeter macro lens and you can see we're having a lot of the same problems that we did with the Nikon where we're getting that distortion on the edges and we're getting those very oval shaped instead of having a consistent look across the whole frame. So I definitely have to give the bokeh to the Sigma on this one. Just having that perfectly consistent across the whole image is really fantastic. So that's gonna wrap it up for all of the test images that we're gonna look at. If you guys wanna download the CR2 files of these, they're gonna be linked to in the description below, so definitely check that out. We have one more test to run, and that's looking at the AF speeds of all three of these lenses, going from infinity all the way to close focus to see which one can get there faster. So let me jump into that test, and then we'll wrap it up. Okay, so we have all three lenses lined up on the left. We have the Sigma 105 in the middle is the Nikon and on the right is the 100 millimeter macro. And we're pulling close focus. I think it's about four feet. So it's a little bit further than close focus for all of these lenses, but we're racking all the way to infinity. And then we're going to pull to that close focus ish area. So I'm just going to go frame by frame so you can see them. They all start right at the same time, right about there. They all start kicking on the 100 millimeter is already done and is taking the photo. The Sigma takes the photo, and then a couple frames later, the Nikon takes the photo. And now I'll just play that back for you in full speed. So as you can see, it's all very comparable, and I'm playing it with the sound on, so you can see that there's three distinct clicks. The first one is that 100 millimeter macro on the right, the next one is the Sigma, and then in the middle is the Nikon, or the last click that you're hearing. And then the last thing that we like to take a look at, which is a huge factor when deciding on these lenses, is the cost of them. The Canon comes in at the cheapest at $750. The Sigma is the next cheapest at $1,600, which is almost double what the Canon is. And then the Nikon blows them all out of the water at $2,200, which is pretty expensive for a fast prime like this that's a very specialty lens. If you guys wanna try out any of these lenses for yourself, there'll be links in the description below to head on over to lensprotigo.com and rent them. If you guys have any questions about these lenses or comments on the test that I did, make sure to leave those down below and I'll get back to you. If you guys enjoy this video and want to see more just like it, make sure to hit that like button, subscribe for new videos every single week, and I'll see you in the next one.